uh, background and uh, um, engineering as well as biomechanics background. And what's particularly relevant to this is they work with both British Eventing and the British Horse Racing Authority on testing. And so what I think right now in the US probably was one of our weakest areas was our consistent testing of turf. So we're gonna talk a lot about turf because we want it, well, because that's where a lot of the excitement is in racing and it's also probably our weakest area. I'll turn it over to you too. Um, so um, I think, so I'm going to, to start this uh, presentation, if that's okay, and then I'll pass over to, um, to Sarah, Sarah Jane a little bit later on um, in, the, in the talk. Um, so thank you very much, Mick, for the introduction. And um, so I'm Alison Northrop, and I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the project that we're currently undertaking, actually, for the um, looking at race courses in, in Great Britain at the moment. Um, so the work is funded and supported by the Horse Welfare Board through the Racing Foundation. Um, we It's an 18 month project and we're, as I say, we're about two, two thirds of the way through. Um, the aim of this project is actually looking at investigating the use of a, a relatively new handheld testing device um, to measure turf race courses. And as Mick um, said a moment ago, we've actually already done quite a bit of work looking at event courses. And so we're going to introduce really the idea of this piece of equipment in relation to what we've done so far. Um, so just before I go any further, um, I'll just give you a fairly sort of general aims of this project, uh, the, the project that we're actually undertaking at the moment. So just to start off with, the project aims to collect data at all race courses in Great Britain um, using the Vienna Surface Tester directly uh, comparable to the turf going. So that's the turf going description and then the official turf going value. So we're collecting data on race day um, and we're following the racing line. Um, and as I say, we're visiting all race courses, um, as many as possible. I think it's probably minimum uh, race courses we're, we're visiting three times to collect um, representative data really throughout the season for both flat jump and jump race courses. So in addition to comparing this, this data to turf going, we're also really quite interested in looking at how um, these measurements relate to performance of the horse. And so we're looking at race times. Um, Sarah, Sarah Jane is going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit of detail uh, shortly. Um, so I won't say too much about that at this point. Um, alongside collecting this data, of course, one of the first things that we want to really be able to understand is actually the, the threshold ranges of this data that we're collecting with this new piece of equipment, the, the Vienna Surface Tester. Some of you may have seen one, some of you may not. If you just have a look on the image on the right hand side, you can see two of our research assistants actually um, just uh, dropping this. Essentially, it's a, a instrumented bowling ball. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about it um, as we go through. So that, that idea of the thresholds is something that we've already developed in eventing uh, cross-country courses. And I'll, I'll talk about that, I think, in the next slide. So if this data that we collect, um, or should we be able to produce consistent and reliable measurements of the turf um, and of going, um, then the aim will be to propose a protocol that in, indeed may be something that is used to measure going on race day, or as we're beginning to find with the data that we're collecting, it, it could actually be a really valuable tool when we're looking at, at pre and post um, meet. Um, so sort of preparation in advance and um, after throughout the year. Um, and so that's really one of the reasons why we're, we're very pleased to be able to talk to you today to, to introduce um, this, this work. We're actually taking measurements every 250 metres at the moment around the race course. Um, and uh, this is something that we, again, we developed um, when we were looking at, at cross-country turf going. So just a little bit of background really to um, introduce this work. So um, this is more about what we've been doing on cross-country courses. So all of these images that you see are actually taken when we've been looking at the turf, galloping turf in between cross-country fences in eventing. Most of the work's been in, in the UK, um, but a little bit has been uh, international as well. 
So just starting off on this slide, I'm conscious there's actually quite a lot going on, on on this slide at the moment, but really just to sort of take us back to almost uh, yeah, a decade ago, 2014, um, we wrote a white paper for the FEI and Sarah Jane uh, was the lead author for this. And actually Mick and Lars and maybe a few others in the room uh, might have been involved in, in this work. But one of the, the kind of key points in relation to, to this paper was actually developing terminology that described the characteristics of the surface that was relevant to the horse. And so when we started thinking about cross-country turf and being able to measure it in a practical way that was possible when you're um, walking across the country, um, we wanted to be able to make sure that we were measuring using test devices that we could then compare directly to the Arona biomechanical surface tester, which is capable of measuring those functional properties that were developed way back in 2014. Um, so if you can see in the middle image, um, this was us actually taking data, the, all of the middle images. We've got um, a number of different handheld devices that we actually investigated. We looked at the Lang penetrometer, uh, we looked at the going stick, and then we also used the Vienna surface tester. And um, essentially from this data, we actually started off with just nine courses uh, in the UK, and we collected data using the Arona biomechanical surface tester alongside these very sort of simple, fairly easy to uh, carry um, pieces of equipment. And what was really interesting from that data was that actually using linear regression, 80% of the variability of cushioning from the Arona biomechanical biomechanical surface tester was predicted by the Vienna surface tester and moisture. So we were really uh, quite happy with, um, again, looking at these different pieces of equipment, we were really happy with the Vienna surface tester and we took it on and extended this project to actually 81 different courses over the period of three years. So it was quite an extensive study. And we just collected data, as I say, with this, this little bowling ball and we then also collected rider data. So it was uh, subjective um, data from event riders on completion of the course. Um, and with all of this information, what we were able to do was develop um, sort of threshold ranges really to help us understand a bit more about how we can classify this, this ground or this going. Um, and you can see just on this image here, if you want to have a look at this in a bit more detail, we published it last um, uh, last year. So Graydon et al. 2023 describes all of the, the work that I've just been talking about. Um, but one of the things that I just suppose want to pull out from this slide is just the fact that um, you've got this colour um, color coded um, uh, sort of thresholds that actually, again, has been really instrumental in being able to produce a nice summary that is relevant uh, to anybody that's managing the course. So we can pick up a, a summary report and actually understand what's going on and pick out any sort of um, maybe extremes or any areas that we want to sort of look at in more detail. And I'll show you a summary report just in a, a couple of slides, I think. Um, just moving on now and thinking a bit about the VST, so this Vienna surface tester or bowling ball um, compared to other handheld devices. One of the things that I think we're quite interested in, or one of the reasons why we were interested in this as a piece of equipment to understand more about the surface is that actually it, it measures um, information lower in the ground or deep in the deeper layers of the ground. And um, you have to forgive this uh, rather terrible sketch of a horse galloping, but it's, what we're trying to show here is this idea that actually when a horse is landing on a surface, the deeper layers of the surface are actually really important. And um, it may be that some of the smaller handheld devices that, that we started off with um, didn't really measure things that were most important or most relevant to the horse. So just uh, again, just a little kind of uh, descriptor or animation to describe what we do with the Vienna surface tester. We drop it from a variety of um, or series of different heights up to almost about a metre, which allows us to produce a response curve, as it were, um, and, and allows us to then measure what's going on in the deeper layers of the surface and also then in the sort of more um, peripheral or the top layers of the surface. Whereas actually quite often when we're looking at um, maybe something like the going stick, it's really picking up what's going on right at the top layer and maybe not what's going on lower down. 
I just have to add that obviously I've included a moisture meter in this uh, little image, but of course moisture is really important. And when we're collecting this data with the VST, um, we always make sure that we're um, actually adding to our, our um, data set, we're looking at moisture as well. And I'll show you that on this next slide here. So um, this slide here, and I'm very aware that for some of you, you may not be able to read all the detail, but what really what I'm trying to um, show you here in this, this, uh, this image is this is our summary report. So when we've collected our data from either a cross country course or a, a race course, um, we end up with a series of um, uh, variables at each location that we've tested. So if you look at the summary um, report, each row essentially is data collected from one location. And we collect soil moisture, um, firmness, depth, energy return and stiffness. And then from this data, we can derive a measure that we call cushioning. And Sarah's going to talk a bit more about that in a moment in relation to performance and that idea of understanding actually what these measurements mean to the horse. So um, if you can see here, I've just highlighted cushioning for you so that you um, can see which um, which row, uh, sorry, which column I'm actually looking at. Um, I'm not sure how big your screen is, so it may not be particularly clear. But I think the other point that I really want to just pull out here is the, the colour. So it just, again, allows us to identify what's going on. And um, this is an example of uh, measurements that we've taken from a flat race course. Um, we have a different summary um, sheet for jump courses. Um, and this information, again, when we're looking at sort of the blue purple colors, it's down in the sort of heavy description, um, heavy going. And then when we've got uh, reading sort of the yellow red, um, we're looking at the much harder sort of firmer um, uh, descriptors. So the other the other just the last point I want to make from this uh, slide is just that we are we have um, uh, calculated a going value um, from this information that we collect. And this is really again, this is to allow us to be able to uh, sort of compare this to our readings that we've got from the, the turf uh, um, going. Um, and it's something that's sort of, again, in um, uh, process at the moment, obviously, when we get to the end of the project, we'll perhaps look at this in a bit more detail. But just a, a reminder, this slide here, and this I think is probably quite important for the purpose of the presentation and for today, is that we are able to collect quite a lot of information um, and also identify information relevant to the top layers of the surface, but also deeper down um, within the surface. And we're finding that actually a lot of clerks are really interested in this um, when indeed they're thinking about things like decompaction um, or irrigation, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, that's hopefully that's that sort of uh, explained that that summary sheet okay for you. The, this this slide here is just coming back to that idea of actually what what's important or what we um, are particularly interested in um, in relation to the information that we're getting from the VST, and that is understanding about the deeper layers of the surface and actually what's important for the horse. Um, when indeed they're, they're galloping across the ground. And really, uh, hopefully you can see within this image, um, it's not a racehorse, but um, it's a, a galloping stride. Um, you can see so from right to left on the, uh, um, on the, the slide, um, you can see that actually as the horse on the right hand side, it's landing on the, the, the surface. Um, and in the middle slide, you can see that this is the um, point of whereby the, the deeper layers of the surface are really relevant to the horse. And this is when cushioning um, is, is particularly important. So just before I pass over to Sarah, I'm kept trying to keep an eye on my time. I'm conscious I'm good at running over. So um, we've just really got just a couple of slides here just to, um, I suppose, give you an overview of what we've collected so far. And this is really just showing our, our going values for both flat um, on this slide and then the next slide is jump uh, race courses. So you can see we've actually done 124 visits so far um, and the majority of our data for flat race courses is sitting within that the regions of, of the good or good to soft. So um, again, the colours um, or the bands um, help to explain that. Um, and then this next slide here, um, so for the jump courses, we've collected data from 142 visits. And we're still obviously um, got a little bit further to go and our analysis will um, start to uh, develop um, as we move forward. But I think one of the really important points 
that I'd like to make as I'm kind of introducing what Sarah's going to talk about is that it's it's all good and well comparing this directly to the, the going um, uh, descriptors. But actually what we're really interested in as well is, is how this relates to the horse and, and actually how our measurements relate to the performance of the horse or the, the race times. So Sarah's going to talk about how we've sort of tried to unpick this and carry out some really interesting analysis in relation to, to cushioning. So I'll pass over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, so we enlisted the help of Simon Rowlands, um, who does a, a, quite a lot of race time analysis. Um, in the UK, quite a bit for time form, um, and has written quite a number of articles related to racing. Um, we, what we wanted to do was to develop a, a preliminary study, really, um, to look at those thresholds that we've developed for our going factor, to look at all of the measurements that we use with the VST that we're collecting, to see whether specific measurements or uh, combinations of measurements were relevant to, to actually horse performance. So the first thing I've done, and apologies if, if this is very obvious to you already, but it wasn't to me when we first started working with Simon, was to just define how Simon um, actually calculates his performance value. And so um, it's called the time-based going allowance. And what he does, first of all, is he'll take uh, the winning performance from a number of meet, uh, of the, all of the races within a meeting. And he uses several factors to be able to then normalize that performance. Um, those relate to the race and the race course itself. So distance and standard time and how those change relative to that race on that day. So if they move the rails and it's a different distance, uh, that's taken into account. And then the, um, the horse related factors, so the ability and the weight carried, and, and in particularly in flat racing, the weight for age allowance, and then environmental factors, so rainfall and wind effects. And again, he uses that mainly in flat racing, um, uh, as in jump racing, generally speaking, they're doing at least one circuit of the track. So that's all taken into account to look at winning performance. And then also to ensure that the race is a true run race, the sectional times and the finish, finishing speed are needed to be able to um, evaluate whether that's the case or not. So then you get a number and from that number, um, the lower the values, the faster the firm, the firmer the ground is and the higher value the slower and the softer the ground is. So it, it essentially suggesting that a, a, um, a lower rated horse is, is only needed for faster, firmer ground, whereas a higher rated horse is, is, is needed as the ground gets softer and, and heavier. And that's obvious, that's my interpretation. So I hope that's, um, that's, that's helpful. And so what we did, we actually, in, because this is a preliminary study, we took 25 flat race meetings and 25 jump race meetings and Simon analyzed each individual race. And from that information, we were able to determine a time-based going allowance for each of those meetings. Okay, Ali, do you want to just move on? Okay, so we haven't published this yet. So this is very new data and this graph is a summary, if you like, of the most important findings that we had for flat racing. I'll just explain the graph first of all. So on the bottom axis, you have the time-based going allowance. And what we've done there is included sort of the interpretation of winning speed. So for a, a lower value, um, you're getting a faster time and for a higher value, you get, and that has an influence on the ground. And then the coloured bandings relate to the classification based on the performance rather than um, the going description that you would get um, from the official race day. So then the uh, measurements that are included on the, on the right and the left axes relate to the measurements from uh, the data set that we get that came out as um, the most strongly related to the performance. 
you can see we tried various models actually. So we did use linear models, we use quadratic, um, we also use logarithmic types of models to evaluate which model actually fitted the data best. Um, and what you have here, there are four graphs on there, two relate to cushioning, which are in gray, two relate to firmness, which in black. We looked at 10 race meetings from a single course, and then we added in more courses to see whether the model still held if we actually had those additional courses in there. And we had um, adjusted R squared values from between 0.7 and 0.9 for these data. So it's really quite strong and we are hoping Still hot. Ali, can you just move that on? Because it'll, yeah, okay. So I'll just, oh, sorry, go back one a minute. Thank you. Okay. So what's interesting here, I suppose, mainly is the fact that, that this is a quadratic relationship and that actually, of course, as we go from heavy going, um, then the uh, time based going, going allowance goes down. So you actually start to get faster ground. But as we go through those bandings, the, the middle one in, in green there, in the bright green, is the good going. And so then as we go into good to firm, we get to a point which is around about a cushioning value of about 10 and a half kilonewtons, um, where the horses actually start to slow down. So that's suggesting at this point that potentially um, as the horses start to experience firmer ground beyond good, um, good to firm, then potentially their stride characteristics change in a way that might actually slow them down. Okay, Ali, we can go to the next one. So this is for jump racing. Um, the, it's the same setup with the graph. So the performance based going, uh, time based going allowance along the bottom axis. The colored bandings relate to the performance um, classifications rather than the official going. On this occasion, the two measurements from the VST that came out as being um, um, most uh, strong, strongly related were again cushioning, which is on the right hand axis, and the other one was depth. So depth had a, an adjusted R squared value of 0.8, but that was only for a single course. And you can see that across the black dotted line at the top there. So that, that actually was a really nice relationship. But when we added in the additional data from all courses, then that relationship was really, it was quite a weak relationship. It obviously doesn't hold. Um, this again was a non-linear relationship. So we had a, a logarithmic uh, relationship here. And for cushioning, which wasn't quite as strong for the individual course, but it was the strongest relationship for all courses um, at around about 0.5. And you can see there that if we take the earlier date, so from heavy, so when the ground's soft and heavy, the relationship is not dissimilar to that um, for the flat relationship. But as we get more towards the good and the good to firm, then obviously we don't see the, see the same dropping off of speed. One of the reasons for that is actually in this data set, our data only goes up to 8.5 kilonewtons. And so it, it is quite possible and it, it's, it's not unlikely for, for jump racing that we wouldn't measure those values anyway. We wouldn't expect the ground to become that firm, even in summer jump racing. Okay, Ali, I think you can move on from that. Okay, so, so cushioning has come out really strongly. And Lars, I, I, I apologize if I kind of steal your thunder slightly on this one, because I've included the FEI um, definition of cushioning here. So how much a surface is supported compared to how much it gives when riding on it. And, why is it important to us for this data set? Well, obviously, we've already seen that it, it quite clearly links to the data that we're, we're finding in, in relation to performance. And we have, I, I know Mick, I think, showed some slide, slides with normalized data from the OBST, whereas we're actually using the values in cushioning. 
and I included there a slide from some RBC work where they measured horses um, that were galloping across a force plate between 20 and 30 um, miles an hour, so a bit below sort of maximum racing speeds, but nevertheless, it gives you an indication of the magnitude of those forces that you might see being experienced at Gallup. So one of their findings, which was interesting and probably links to some of the work that we've, we've just shown you, um, is that uh, when they were increasing in speed, the um, proportion of force, particularly vertical force supporting body mass, altered from um, a higher relationship, so higher forces for the forelimbs, and then gradually the, the loading on the hind limbs became greater until the relationship was roughly 50-50. So although one or two of these uh, graphs don't quite hit the 10 kilonewton mark, they're, they're actually getting quite close. And one of the things they said at the time in, in that paper related to the fact that uh, um, at, at maximal racing speed, there must be limb limits. So the idea is that the, um, the, the distribution of force, particularly the vertical force between fore and hind limbs needed to change and the stride characteristics needed to change possibly because to, to avoid reaching those limb limits. Okay, Ali, I think we can move on. So, so I wanted to try and find some information that would help us to support what we found so far with our initial data. And, and these two pieces of information are really interesting. They're both from large, larger pieces of work. So the Morris West et al. Um, information there is from Australia. It's from over 25,000 starts. And I've just picked out some data from this where they looked at a lot uh, amongst many other variables, the number of strides um, that were produced in 200 meters in the early section of the race, the mid section of the race and the late section of the race. And hopefully you can see um, the colors there in, in blue, red and, and green. And Ali, do you want to just, thank you. Um, okay, and so what's interesting there relates to the difference there, uh, synthetic was their reference, and here we have the turf, different types of turf going, um, for firm going what you see is that there's a fewer number of strides for 200 metres, both early and late in the race, compared to the reference of synthetic at the top, and then also quite a lot of the range of, of the turf grounds up to soft ground um, in the early and late part of the race. And although you could say, well, okay, that means that, that they probably go faster rather than slower, um, what was discussed as uh, uh, in, within the discussion on this paper was the fact that they may actually be overstriding um, on firm ground. So, it's not strong evidence, but it's some evidence to say there is a difference, at least. The other piece of work on my right-hand side relates to a piece of work done uh, um, in Japan. Um, and this is a Japanese derby. And data was collected over three years. So it's 72 horses in total. The ground for um, this study was reported as firm for all three years because of the time of year that the, the race is run. Um, what's really interesting here is that they, they videoed the, the, the horses running um, over the two laps of the race, and you can clearly see a difference there in relation to the change in speed and the change in stride length from the first lap, which is in red, to the second lap, which is in, in blue. So it, it does hold some weight to say that the, the, there, could, there could well be a threshold for, um, for speed that relates to ground and, and where horses actually do start to slow down because of the change in stride characteristics because of the fact that the ground's firm. Okay, I think we can move on. Um, so on, on the flip side, and of course, we've seen an awful lot of this in the UK 
um, in the last two, three months. Um, but soft and heavy ground has been something, especially in the northwest in Scotland, we've measured quite frequently. And I put this slide in really because when we looked at the data, especially for jump racing over the winter period, we have um, in, in our data set at the moment, we have quite a, a, a number of um, measurements from, for, from a number of race courses where the forces produced by the VST um, are within a, a sort of a range that would you expect to see for trotting. And so that sort of questions the, the, um, the ability of the, the ground to be able to um, support the horse at that point. And, I, and I, I really still like this piece of data that came from the French group. Uh, and I know it's to do with trotters and it isn't galloping horses, but I think it's really useful to clearly show when the ground doesn't support the horse, um, then the horse has to actually change in some way to be able to, to keep going at approximately the same speed. So the graph on the right there is from two different conditions. Um, you have um, firm ground, and then you also have um, soft ground, and this was all taken on a beach um, and with a foreshoe that's attached to the horse's um, falling. And what you see there is very clearly that there's a, there's a marked reduction in vertical force, showing that on the deep sand, um, the, the, the ground doesn't support the horse to go at that particular speed. And so on the, the smaller graphs at the bottom there that relate to braking and propulsion for the black graph, which is the firmer ground, you can see that there's roughly about the same amount of force above the, the zero line as there is below the zero line, saying that that's approximately steady state. But when you then look at the, um, the gray line, which relates to the deep soft ground, <clears throat> the breaking part of that phase is very small, whereas the propulsive part is really quite large, suggesting that the horses are having to provide propulsion with every stride to accelerate to try and maintain speed. So when you start to then put that into the context of um, galloping and racing speed and completing two or three laps of a course plus jumping, um, it gives you an indication of how much um, more effort is required by the horse to be able to do that. Okay, Ali, I think we might be back to you for the next slide. So thank you, Sarah, for um, doing a really nice job of actually helping us understand a bit more how um, the read measurements that we're taking um, relate to <coughs> what's happening with the performance of the horse. Um, we've just really got a couple of, I suppose, a couple of um, uh, sort of conclusion, conclusions really from this work. and. I guess one of the points that I think is quite useful to measure um, and mention at this point is this idea that actually we've had some really nice positive um, and positive engagement from all the clerks. So this has been um, quite important, I think, for us to start thinking about how this piece of equipment can be quite relevant for maintenance. Um, and actually, again, when we're talking to clerks, when we, we measure, you know, every time we're on the course, um, it's really clear that actually they're really interested in, in this piece of equipment to help them um, throughout the year. So when they're maintaining the surface and that idea of, of pre-race and also post-race preparation um, for, the, for the next meet. Um, so I think that's, that's a really important point to make. We are, as part of the project, quite keen to collect a bit more um, opinion data, um, so a, a bit more subjective data from various stakeholders. So we're hoping that that will include uh, trainers and jockeys as well as uh, clerks and, and grounds people. Um, just a couple of last points, I suppose, to, to conclude. And I know Sarah's you know, given a, a, a sort of a bit of conclusion of, uh, um, in relation to performance anyway, but we are aware that, that the cushioning data that we're collecting from the VST really does appear to relate to performance, um, the performance of the horse. But what we're really keen to do in the future, because we've only selected a small number of courses, is actually roll this out and um, look at it in a bit more detail before we can uh, confirm uh, that these these findings are, are um, indeed 
um, important um, across the, all the courses in the UK. Um, the last point that I've just put here, really, and I guess this li links very nicely to what you're talking about today, um, is this idea that actually the Vienna Surface Tester is quite uh, rich in terms of data. We are getting quite a lot of data from it. Um, and of course, at the moment, we are only collecting data every 250 metres. Um, but we have, again, you know, th through discussions with Clarks, um, we've talked about this idea of, of potentially taking high resolution um, data um, when needs be. And of course, because we're getting information about the deeper layers of the surface and also the, the top layers, um, this is, is proving to be quite a, a useful um, uh, technique um, and method. So really, just before I finish, just want to acknowledge and thank the rest of the team, because we've got um, an amazing group of people that are working on this project with us. Um, and so uh, just really want to acknowledge them as well. So thank you very much. We've got some time for some questions for Alison and Sarah. So do you see any hope that this would get so that track ratings in the UK would begin to use more quantitative data rather than qualitative data? Um, Sarah, do you want to start or shall I? Would you? Okay. Um, uh, but, well, obviously, we, at the moment, we have two ratings. We have the going stick ratings, which are the official going stick ratings, and then also the qualitative descriptions. There has been a lot of talk, um, certainly from quite a number of the clerks, that they would really like, they did really like a sort of a, a, a 0 to 10 or a 1 to 10 scale um that and and they could go anywhere in the country and they would know that a number five is a number five so there is a an appetite for that whether the work that we've done and the ongoing work of one or two other groups related to this um actually results in that happening i don't know um but certainly i think there is an appetite for that I had a question. Um, as far as the Vienna surface tester goes, has there been any interest in looking at, suppose, the dirt or synthetic track on um, types? Have it, has any testing been done on that? And then my other question relating to that is, so using the Vienna in lieu of the OVST, particularly on the turf, you know, one of the things that people often ask about for me anyways, will be like, okay, well, you know, we're talking about vertical measurements. What about the fore and aft, kind of like what we get with the OBST and say the grip, or maybe even with the going stick, the shear? Okay, um, right, okay. So, so let me take <laughs> so, this one. It's getting late, it's getting, it's, okay. Um, in terms of the appetite for looking at um, synthetics, yes, definitely. In fact, we are in discussions at the moment with in relation to training tracks. Nick, who hopefully is, is with us at the moment, is sitting very quietly in the background, um, who is um, in charge of the tracks in uh, Newmarket, um, Lambourne and also Epsom is very interested in, um, in us working with him to develop similar techniques for, for measuring training tracks, particularly synthetic tracks. And we actually have had a bit of interest as well from some of the, the race courses, haven't we, Ali? Do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, so we've, we've, we've started doing a little bit of um, uh, data collection just really at some of the I mean in the 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 UK we've actually only got seven all weather or synthetic um, race tracks um, but uh, we've been a lot of people are quite interested in actually helping them with their maintenance um, having some sort of piece of equipment that can help them measure what's going on and so we've just carried out actually just a very very small project but using data loggers um, to measure temperature 
um, and and then actually look at um, what you know what's going on um, temperature deeper in the surface, and then also taking our measurements with the VST because of course at the moment moisture is a really important part of what we're doing when we measure with the VST. Moisture is is really important, but we actually want to be able to understand a bit more about how temperature um, fits in with that whole um, you know that. The, the data that we're collecting um, in terms of how we're describing it. So, yeah, there is definitely an interest. And I know yesterday, Sarah and I were both at uh, um, a meeting with um, for the B through the BHA for a, a conference with uh, the research, uh, sorry, race course association. And uh, there were a number of um, people that were coming up to us, clerks who met, managed the all weathers, and they were really interested in us taking it a bit further. So, yes. Um, and I don't know, Sarah, I might pass back to you for the next yeah, for the second one. Yeah, yeah you might be able to answer that. Yeah. OK, so something that we did and that we, we didn't do as often, but we started to trial during the time that we were collecting data from um, cross country tracks was to look at the shear vein test, which I know you've got one as well. Um, and so we and, and principally I took most of those measurements as we were going around the event courses when I wasn't needed to do anything else. So um, we trialed it. We have trialed it a little bit on the race courses as well. Um, and you know, because of the fact that we are interested in knowing more about grip, um, unfortunately, it does seem to have certain, attributes, for instance, it does seem to be very much of um, a user dependent piece of equipment. So if we give it to anybody else, they generally get something different. When we were testing the uh, cross country tracks in particular, it obviously that it's a bit more challenging. They are a bit firmer on the whole. Um, some of them are, are very on turf. Um, some of them tend to have um, quite a lot of um, of, of root structure there and organic matter within the top surface. And, and what we tended to find was that they were, they were very good at identifying the point where you might start to sort of uh, damage the root structure. Um, so that was something that we were quite aware of. We're not, although we've got some interesting data from race courses, we're not convinced that actually this is a tool that's going to tell us what we need to know, partly because it's rotational. And although, yes, it's potentially measuring aspects of shear resistance, it doesn't go into the ground very far. And um, it also doesn't really tell us about what's happening um, relative to a horse where it's, it, you know, the sort of the hoof landing and slide, which is actually quite a complex um, situation biomechanically. So, so we had, and, and obviously the Glen Withy that we developed and we tested with, with Mick some years ago um, is useful, but it, it's certainly not a tool that you could take out on a, on a turf race track in the UK anyway. So, so we haven't got a solution for that yet. And if you have one, we're very interested to, <laughs> to uh, collaborate on something to, to see if we can improve what we're doing. Thank you. Other questions? All right. 